Firstly, let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Professor Mick Cox here at the LSE, Emeritus Professor of International uh, Relations and Founding Director of LSE Ideas, who are one of the co-hosts of this event today with the Department of International History here uh, at the LSE. And I'm delighted to invite uh, Assistant Professor or Dr. Simon Miles from Duke University to speak to what I think is an absolutely fantastic good book on the beginning of the end of the Cold War, very Churchillian, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning, Simon, I noticed that. Uh, Simon did his uh, bachelor's in Toronto, I think that's right, did his master's here at the LSE, I assume in the Department of International History, a great department here at the LSE, and then you did your uh, PhD at the Un uh, University of Texas in Austin, which I actually know quite well. So it's wonderful to welcome you here and in, in this, and I hope everything holds up in terms of the technicalities. We don't normally have problems, Simon, so I'm sure that's going to do very well. Um, Simon teaches as assistant professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy down in Duke, uh, where you've been, I think, since 2017. Uh, you've written this wonderful book. I also, I'll flag up what I think is going to be your next book on the Warsaw Pact, which will be a very interesting story in its own right. And of course, you've written in a number of journals, Diplomatic History Journal of Cold War Studies on the subject. And the topic for today is basically the title of uh, Simon's new book, Engaging the Evil Empire, Washington, Moscow, and the Beginning of the End of the Cold War. Now, the first thing I'm going to say very quickly, Simon, before I bring you on to say, if, say what you're going to say, is you're a very brave man to go over that that very well, that very well uh, dug up field. You know, it's not a subject that has been uninvestigated over the last few years, ever since the beginning, what started happening in 1989 and then in 1991. But I think you've brought something really original and fresh to a very, very old debate. So my, my first words are but one of congratulations to you. Uh, I'm gonna now pass over to Simon to outline the main arguments in what, 15 minutes or something like that? Simon, if that's okay with you. I'm then gonna ask you a few questions uh, and then we'll move over to the participants of which there's a very good number today. That's great. Well over 50 and that's, that's a fantastic number. So, Simon, again, welcome, congratulations, and over to you to present your main arguments from your, from your book on engaging the evil empire. Over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mick. It's great to be uh, back at the LSE, albeit uh, virtually, uh, due, to the, uh, due to the current situation. Um, but it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to join you and everyone else uh, at, uh, at, at the LSE over Zoom uh, from here in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm, I'm really grateful to, to Grant and Rohan uh, for, for arranging this and, and to you, Mick, for agreeing to, to talk about my book. Um, so I'm gonna try and undershoot the 15 minutes because uh, I'd much rather talk with you all than, than, than at you. Uh, but let me, let me just start by saying why I wrote this, this, this book. Um, it's really a puzzle-driven book. Uh, and to me, the big puzzle was how did we get from the alleged or so-called death of detente, heralded by, among other things, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979, to the kind of salad days of U.S.-Soviet cooperation, which characterize uh, the late 1980s and which have become sort of a textbook case of rivals putting their differences aside and cooperating for kind of the good of humanity or, or what, what have you. Uh, and I use the term textbook case advisedly because it, it's, it's literally in so many textbooks, right, that, that this is something that can be done, that, that competition can be transcended or overcome in some way. So this period in the late 1980s itself is an extraordinarily rapid denouement to the Cold War from 1985, say, until 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Of course, 1989 uh, along the way. And 
my sense of how quick that was, was really compounded by the notion that what came before in the first half of the 1980s doesn't read like a progress story, right? It doesn't read like a shift towards uh, a better status quo. It's the so-called second Cold War. Uh, of gerontocracy in the Kremlin, no one with whom Reagan could do business, or of course, Reagan unwilling to do business, right? Just being pure hardline ideological uh, anti-communism. Anti and this seems to me a really important puzzle because as we know from history, um, major paradigm shifts in the international system like the end of the Cold War, have historically only been brought about by major power war. And while certainly the end of the Cold War was not completely peaceful, uh, the process is, is certainly far more peaceful than the events culminating in 1945 or in 1919 or what have you. So I was puzzled by this transition and the beginning of this transformation of the world. And it seemed to me that something had to have happened during the first half of the 1980s in order to make the latter half of the 1980s possible, but that just wasn't there in the conventional wisdom and in most of our histories uh, of this really important time. So I, I went looking uh, and I went, I went hunting in the archives, not only of the United States and of Russia to try to tell as balanced a story as I could between the two superpowers, but also in the archives of their allies. And so in this uh, in this book, documents from Canada, the UK, West Germany, and France join with the American record to sell one side of the beginning of the end of the Cold War story. Uh, and documents from Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and Ukraine join with uh, the corpus of Soviet documents, which is available to tell the other side uh, of that story. And, and let me just tell you very briefly what I found. The, the main three arguments which I advance uh, in this book. So the first argument I make in this book is that the key to understanding the speed and the scope of the changes at the end of the 1980s, that is to say between 1985 and 1991, lies in the beginning of the decade. The time period my book focuses on, which is from 1980 until 1985. During that time period, two major shifts occurred. First, from a balance of power, a Cold War balance of power perceived to favor the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 1980s to one more accurately understood to favor the United States by the midpoint of the decade. And second, from a war of words and back channel dialogue uh, between the two sides and certainly the two superpowers to the overt dialogue and symmetry with which we associate the end of the Cold War, Reagan and Gorbachev, Bush and Gorbachev, etc. So those two shifts, I argue, are the key to understanding what comes thereafter. And I locate those in the first half of the 1980s. To understand those two shifts, I advance two further arguments. The first has to do with the United States, and that is that Ronald Reagan, throughout this period and conceiving of it before coming into office, implemented a, a dual-track grand strategy towards the Soviet Union, which shaped both of these processes. Well-known is what I call and what Reagan calls peace through strength. The arms build up, the ideological offensive, the political efforts to shore up, among other things, NATO, um, the technological and economic wor uh, work as well. That's vintage Reagan, right? The man who is, for better or for worse, uh, the kind of contemporary avatar of, of American exceptionalism. Less well known, and, and what really comes out in international archival work, is the parallel track. So if peace through strength was the stick, quiet diplomacy, as I call it, and as Reagan called it, was the corresponding carrot. Uh, and in the book, I showcase back channel efforts, which not only kept the two sides talking when most of the world, indeed many in Moscow and Washington, believed that they weren't, but also which achieved real preliminary gains on which the two sides could build further on. 
And then my third main argument has not to do with the United States, but with the Soviet Union. Uh, and I, th I think in, in this case, as a, as a guest at the International History Department at LSE, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but I'm often frustrated by the extent to which in a lot of Cold War history, the United States is the actor, right? Everyone else is just acted upon. Uh, and in this book, I try to show that the Soviet Union, that Moscow indeed, including those, those leaders whom we associate uh, not exactly with vigor, like late, the late years of Leonid Brezhnev, but also Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernyenko, had grand strategies of their own. That they were basically trying to operationalize through uh, diplomacy the core of Soviet and contemporary Russian military doctrine, which was to use space to buy time. Uh, and that they wanted to reduce tensions to create breathing space uh, for the Soviet Union in particular to get the economy back on track. And that even for up to the early Gorbachev years, this was less about cooperation, but actually about competition, about being able to compete better later with the United States after taking a pause and being able to kind of refit uh, and, 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 uh, and emerge reinvigorated, uh, if you will. And that's the story across all four leaders, though in the book I showcase some of the, the variations therein. So those three arguments uh, about the importance of the 80s, the early 1980s, the importance of Reagan's approach to the United States, and the importance of Soviet leaders uh, are the three main arguments that, that I make in this book. And I think I'll just leave it there um, and, and look forward to taking uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. That was terrific and very succinct and to the point. Uh, I, I've got about a thousand questions and points of my own to make as an old Cold War historian uh, who actually lived through the whole of the Cold War. I must be one of the very few people left alive who was born on the 11th of March 1947 and is still around today. So I, I, I was there at, at creation uh, in terms of the true induction on the 12th of March, I suppose. Anyway, no autobiography too much. Uh, but as you know, here at LSE Ideas, we have a fantastic Cold War studies program now run by Dr. your supervisor, I suppose, Rohan, I, I believe, or whoever it was, but it's Rohan. So we've done a great job together and we, we run this journal, as you know. this. And I think a number of questions arise from me, not just from the journal, from my own thought, but let me just throw one at you to start off with. I have to admit, I started life as a Sovietologist. There's not many of us left alive today, you know. Simon, and I do remember very well the debates on the Soviet side in, from the late 70s into the early 80s. And this kind of weird reversal goes on. So you, you talk about the early 80s and compare that to the later part. Um, I, I kind of also, I take a longer view, basically. The 1970s looks like a period of American decline, which you talk about, and Reagan, I think, you know, felt that. And on the Soviet side, a kind of sense that the history is on our side. You know, the correlation of forces is, you know, moving in our direction. But when you started looking at some of the Soviet stuff, both then and actually since, there's a real sense of worry on the Soviet side, I think. Even in the late 70s, imperial overstretch, to use a phrase popularized by Paul Kennedy, yeah? Uh, Afghanistan is not turning into the success story they thought it might turn into. Uh, demography is moving in the wrong direction. Uh, people are not living as long. And then to, to add to all that, there's a lot of debate going on at the time on the third world, which doesn't come into your book very much, but I'll just mention it. Namely, why do we bother? You know, it's just, just the burden. So, just the first broad point I'd throw in, sorry, it's a fairly long and convoluted kind of point stroke question is, was it just the early 80s? Do we not need to take a kind of slightly longer view? It's this extraordinary transformation from the 70s into the 80s overall. And the Soviets began to understand that, even under Andropov. Oh, yeah. um, very much so. I mean, the thing about Andropov, you know, he played a big role here, kind of identifying some of the real fundamental weaknesses stresses and strains in the Soviet system. And in some senses, I've always regarded Gorbachev, and not exactly as uh, Andropov's uh, replacement after Andropov died, but somebody who would implement some of the reforms that Andropov himself was either mm -hmm. unable or unwilling 
to do. If you could pick up on that broad question. Sorry it was so long, Simon, but again, thank you. No, that's, I mean, there's, there's so much there. It would be hard to do full justice to it. Uh, let me just address the kind of the early 80s point, because this is uh, important for my book. Um, and and the, the, the sense that I get about the Soviet worldview, both about themselves and about the rest of the world, uh, at the early 80s is a mixture of in short-term confidence, but long-term worries. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see in this period is that they're still seeing what's coming out of the 1970s. Uh, they still believe that they have strategic nuclear superiority, of course, uh, a pretty salient uh, thing for them. The, the one element of, of, uh, of kind of the, the correlation of forces that you didn't mention was the economy. Yeah. Uh, and that's really critical. Uh, not that the Soviet economy is, is uh, you know, doing great. Um, but after the 1970s, it kind of looks like a lot of the shocks of that decade, which, which were so punishing in particular for the United States, that the quasi-autarchic countries of this, uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were insulated from them. And of course, the major point was oil that everything that caused what in the US was called sort of panic at the pump, uh, the long, long lines just to get gas, and that's not a uniquely American phenomenon, of course, um, that all redounded to the benefit of Moscow and its allies because they were exporters of oil. And so sky high oil prices, even if they were OPEC's doing, were great news for Moscow. So in the 1980s, at the very, very beginning, you have this little, period of time during the final year or so of Leonid Brezhnev's life, where Soviet leaders are saying to themselves, things are going quite well for us right now. Things are going to get worse. But right now, we think we have the Americans kind of where we want them. And this new Reagan guy seems to basically agree with us. So we need to try to lock in those advantages in, as, as quickly as possible using diplomacy, using the tools that are actually available to us. Um, and of course, they don't succeed in that effort, but, but that's their thinking. So uh, I would say that we agree uh, in the basic characterization of the contours of how the Soviet perception is. Uh, my argument for, for the beginning with, with, with 80 um, beyond just uh, a desire to kind of keep the book short and manageable and, you know, uh, not go all the way back to Kenan and the Soviet Union containing the seeds of its own destruction, blah, 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 um, is that that's a little window where they're kind of right at the crest of the wave and they're looking down and they can see what lies ahead. And so that's when they start really working the issue. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there are real obstacles to that. But Andropov, if I can just pick up on uh, the point you made there, I think epitomizes this. Uh, he knows better than anyone else the real problems, right? We know now that he was seeing the more raw intelligence, mm. which was then massaged before it made its way to the Politburo leadership. Uh, so Andropov has a very good understanding, and of course, not just him, it's his inner circle, including, but not limited to, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, and Andropov has another, there's, uh, there's a really great memoir uh, by a guy called Nikolai Leonov, who was the head of intelligence ana analysis, um, at, I think the research department, they called it, at the KGB, uh, who wrote a really wonderful memoir. Um, in which he talks about how Andropov, Andropov understanding this in a, in a way which had never occurred to me until I read this, but as a function of defections. And not the high profile people, not the Oleg Gordievskys or, or, the, or the people who get, who get known, but everyday run of the mill junior KGB officers who are highly educated, politically reliable, et cetera, everything you would expect to be kind of a model homo sovieticus, go to the West and very, very quickly decide that there's nothing for them at home anymore. Uh, and Andropov is hearing about these defections. And if these people are giving up on the Soviet Union after a few months in Spain, then what does that tell you about the longevity mm. and, and the, the vitality of the Soviet project. To Andropov, mm. it, it was not good things.
Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on one further question. Then I've got lots of Q and A coming up, and I also encourage people out there to submit as many questions as they could as possible. And I'll try and I'll try I'll try and feed them into to Simon as quickly as possible. The other question rises to me about um, inevitability. It's a kind of conceptual problem, but it's a, it's an important one. Inevitability, and dare I also raise another conceptual question? prediction. It seems to me there's an interesting paradox, uh, and I've written about this myself, so but anyway, I won't go over all of that. On the one hand, it seems that very few of the experts actually predicted what finally happened, which you describe in great, great detail and, and with great verve in your book. But very few people predicted that, it seems to me. They may have understood there was a crisis, but they never thought it would lead to 1989. And they certainly never thought it would lead to 1991.1. On the other hand, after it's happened, they kind of start saying, well, it was bound to happen. Kind of inevitability. So on the one hand, you've got, you know, those who failed to anticipate the possibility of it ever ending. And there were quite a few of those, I imagine. Academics as well as policy people. And on the other hand, a whole group of people after the event say, well, I told you so. It was bound to happen. Do you kind of... I know you don't, you don't deal directly with those kind of methodological questions in your, your book, but what, how would you address those, those that paradox, I suppose it is, or contradiction, Simon? So at the beginning of the book, uh, I talk a little bit about uh, two phenomena, which in particular my colleagues who are social scientists and political scientists uh, always really like to latch on to, and, and the, those are structure and agency. <laughs> right and 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 is is the story of the cold war a story of agency and, and that there are a lot of answers potential explanations it could be a gorbachev story where he transcends the competition it could be a reagan story where he finally takes the fight to the reds it could be uh, a social movement story about anti-nuclear campaigners concerned scientists uh helsinki networks etc cetera, etc cetera. there's there's a lot of kind of parts that you could tell to that story um, or is it a structural story? Did, did uh, the forces of international economics and uh, the, the rise of kind of uh, neoliberalism in particular in the 1980s beyond the United States, what, did that all mean that uh, a country like the Soviet Union's odds of survival were constantly diminishing uh, in, in a changing world that, you know, as, as, as a quasi-autarky, it, it, it could adjust to, but could never probably really embrace or, or fully uh, integrate in. And of course, my answer is the, the, the quintessential historian's answer, which is very frustrating <laughs> to said colleagues, uh, which is that the answer to is it structure or agency is yes. Um, and, and, you know, Mick, I think we know this from just our own lives, right? Not as historians, not as professors, just as, as people in the world, that, that different people will respond to like circumstances differently, right? The, the military will have, uh, has what they call the OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, et cetera, et cetera. That orienting is critical. Uh, to shaping how how we behave, what we what we do, and so I make the argument in this book that certain things happened, like the big shift in power, but the two sides respond to it differently, right? A perceived weaker United States rejects overt diplomacy and sticks with covert. A perceived weaker Soviet Union rejects covert diplomacy and wants overt. And the, so they actually flip in an interesting way. And so I don't see any inevitability about the end of the Cold War. And I, I try to be uh, you know, careful in the book not to say, and then Reagan and Gorbachev sat down in, in Geneva in November 85, and that was the ball game, you know, uh, took them six years to unravel it. Uh, it's a highly contingent process. It's a highly, highly contingent process. But it's a process with deeper roots that I think we can identify not only in the first half of the 80s to be, you know, I, I don't want to overinflate my, my claims here. You can see them going back earlier, as you very accurately pointed out, into the 1960s, 70s, and you can see them even going back further. So my sense, for example, of a character like Ronald Reagan uh, 
who, when he comes into office, says, uh, well, the Soviet Union is probably going to be with us for about 60 years, uh, and who doesn't think he's going to live to see uh, the end of communism, never mind in Eastern Europe, but also in, in the Soviet Union in Moscow proper. Uh, of course, this comes as a surprise. But I think as that, that Reagan could look back at policy choices which facilitated that process, maybe which accelerated it in some ways, just as a Soviet leader um, and, and you know, especially on the economic front in Soviet history, people like Gaidar and others have written about this and said, you know, yes, things got really nasty, especially after the oil, oil prices tanked uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, but we can see the longer roots um, of this. My uh, book title is, is not a, a Churchill reference. I'm sorry to, to, to disappoint. <laughs> Um, it, but it, there is a very subtle, there's a, there's a wonderful line by the, the author Ian McEwen, uh, where he says something, I'm going to, of course, I chose to bring this up and I'm, I'm now not going to be able to get the quotation exactly right and I'll butcher it. Um, but I, I like the odds that he's not listening to this. Um, he said something about uh, beginnings are, are all artificial. Right, we, we invent beginnings. There's, there's no such thing as a non-invented beginning, mm -hmm. but we need them in order to make sense of life. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was my, my approach here that, you know, understanding what happened later, but, but trying not to make a, 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 an over, well, you could say an overly ambitious or you could just say a facile mm -hmm. uh, claim about inevitability. Um, we can see these root trends and those are the ones which leaders on both sides of the Cold War contest and also leaders who didn't see themselves as really being in the Cold War contest, but who exploited it, uh, capitalized on in order to shape policy. Yeah, that's great. A lot of questions coming in. I could, I, I could ask many more, but that would be deeply unfair. And I don't want to monopolize it. Anyway, let me just bring in some of the great questions I've already received, if I may. Simon, I mean, one actually relates to, to Reagan. They all relate to Re Reagan in a way. How much do you think that Reagan made a difference? Or uh, there is an interpretation, of course, which is very popular uh, in certain political circles. It's Reagan's military buildup, it's SDI, it's contesting the Soviet proxies in Central America. It is raising the military budget to squeeze the Soviet economy at a moment of weakness on the Soviet. How much do you put down to, to that interpretation of the end of the Cold War? Because I think yours is slightly more subtle than that, but I just want to pull, pull, you, pull, you, pull you out on that one. Well, I, uh, I make the argument in the book that uh, Reagan makes a really meaningful difference in this, and that, that American grand strategy under his, his administration is very impactful on the course of the Cold War during these, uh, during these five years and, and the years that follow. Um, and I, I should just caveat this. Uh, that I think the H.W. Bush administration really makes a difference, right? I, I think there's an unfortunate tendency to, to portray this story as one that, you know, the, Re the Reagan people do all the work and then Bush and company just manage not to mess it up. And that's not the case I'm making, though the book isn't really about H.W. Uh, uh, Bush's administration. But the reason Reagan matters isn't just because of, of SDI and, and uh, the ideological offensive, etc. And uh, those matter, uh, those absolutely matter. But the story is more complicated than just what's commonly referred to as maximum pressure. The quiet diplomacy angle, I argue, is critical in this book because I think, again, we kind of get this from, from an interpersonal uh, level. I think this makes a degree of intuitive sense to us, which is that if all you do is, is you know, push, then why would a country like the Soviet Union ever believe that you'll negotiate in good faith? So Reagan was cleverer than that. He did negotiate in good faith, albeit quietly, and made progress on issues like the so-called Siberian Seven, the Pentecostalists who were living in the basement of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, 
they resolve those issues even while the rhetoric is, is, is coming. And, and to be fair, you know, the Soviets gave as good as they got, right? I've, I've kind of trawled through the Pravda articles about the United States. They're likening Reagan to Hitler. I mean, there's all kinds of nasty stuff coming from Moscow too. Uh, I think a lot of this is often, I think, inaccurately portrayed as just a one directional thing. So it's because of the carrot and the stick that I think Reagan matters. Mm. And Reagan got better than many people in his administration with the exceptions of George Shultz, uh, Jack Matlock, who was the NSC senior director for Russia and East, for Soviet Union in Europe, uh, and George H.W. Bush also, Reagan got the interplay between those. So had it just been the military buildup, then I wouldn't probably have come to so positive a conclusion. It was how the United States used carrot and stick and adjusted the ratio between them as things went along that I think he got the results he did, which for which I, you know, I, I laud him uh, in the book. And if you'll just let me make one last point, I don't want to really belabor this, but you know, at Duke, um, I don't just teach history, I teach strategy. Of course, I teach strategy through history. Uh, and, and the point that I always make to, to students which I think is illustrated by Reagan, is that good strategy is iterative and adapts, right? It's not the maximum pressure story of the United States, you know, had a big stick and got a bigger stick. It's rather that it deftly adjusted to changing realities, including those which it had caused to change to a certain mm -hmm. degree, uh, mm -hmm. that really make for the success. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, I'll just add a point, and, and it's not a question. Reagan departs in 88, 89. Bush Sr. comes in, and my impression is that there are those within the Bush Sr. administration in the early, who think that Reagan's probably gone too far. Who think that Reagan... Absolutely. You know, and they want to kind of hold it back and maybe slow the process down for all sorts of reasons, yeah. which are interesting. So, okay, another question coming in. There is a theory of Soviet collapse, which is not exactly the same thing as the end of the Cold War. I, I make a distinction between 89 and 91, although the two are connected. Uh, what about the oil and grain theory uh, of Soviet collapse? Largely on the oil you've mentioned, there's also the grain theory, I suppose, about food and uh, agriculture. I, I suppose that's what that question means. Thanks for that question. Do you want to make uh, over to you? Yeah. Um, so these are the two kind of main commodities which matter to the Soviet Union. Uh, they need to export oil in order to generate the cash to buy grain, of course, from people who are not super keen on taking rubles. Uh, which were not the world's most useful currency at the time. Um, and I think that that's an important part. And the uh, Yegor Gaidar, whom I mentioned earlier, he makes this case uh, very, very forcefully. Uh, and this is certainly one part of the Soviet economic problems that I, that I talk about in the book, that they're not only are they no longer able to generate the hard currency through oil exports that they need in order to buy grain on the world market, um, and also to buy high technology goods, right? That's another key use for hard currency for the Soviet Union that, that they're not able to produce or not able to produce in enough numbers uh, a lot of the uh, more high tech goods which are needed for advanced manufacturing, which has become the norm at this point. Uh, in the book, I talk, I think, uh, about a Soviet economist who estimates that the percentage of all products produced in the Soviet Union which would find any market overseas for export is in the teens. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty sorry show uh, from the Soviet perspective. Oil, very different story. That, everyone wants to buy that. Um, so without kind of going too far down this road, I see that as really important and I don't see it as, as mutually exclusive to the other explanations. This is another historian thing that I like to do, which frustrates my wonderful social scientist colleagues, which is to say, yes, they all matter. The debate's not about which, it's about what's the proportion. And economics really matters in this story. The military matters in this story. Politics and diplomacy also matter in this story. I would also argue that ideology matters in this, in this story. And I think that's hooking on to the point that you just made about 89 and 91 and, and what, those, what those two years, how those two years mean different things. Mm. 
Very. I agree. Now, I'm living over here in the UK. I, I suppose I can still say we're part of Europe. Uh, geographically, in many other ways, we're clearly part of Europe. But there's bound to be a question, and it does come up, and two, two, two questions together, really, here, Simon, although they connect to the same point. What about the role played by a European detente, Helsinki, human rights in the 1970s, Ostpolitik opening up to East Germany, uh, the European engagement, which, which can try to continue in the 1980s. How much do you bring the Europe Europeans into this. We're going to talk about Mrs. Thatcher in a while, who you do mention in the book, I noticed. She's now appearing, of course, in The Crown. Uh, over yeah. <laughs> but how, how, what, what about the detente side of it? What about that engagement side of it? What about the human side of it? How much does that play into your analysis? Or does it contradict your points in, in your book? What do you think? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think that they can all coexist. Uh, in this book, I'll, to be very candid, I, I don't foreground either of those issues. Um, let me talk about, uh, about them both, though, because I do think that they're important. Um, human rights, I'll start with. To Reagan, this was an extremely useful Cold War tool. Um, and it was also the aspect of U.S.-Soviet relations which resonated with him personally uh, and emotionally, I think the second most. Uh, the most would be the threat of nuclear uh, Armageddon. Uh, and there I'm, I'm, I'm using the term Armageddon intentionally because of the biblical connotations that it had for, for Reagan, who was, who was a man of deep faith. Um, but that was probably his main sort of emotionally salient touchstone of the, of the Cold War. Number two was human rights. And there are his diary and, and his uh, not so much his speeches for public consumption, but remarks uh, amongst in, in more intimate settings. He really kind of expresses a, a frustration with uh, what he describes in various ways as kind of the inhumanity of the Soviet system as he sees it. Uh, and it's on human rights, I think it's no coincidence that a lot of the quiet diplomacy successes happen. So on the case of the Siberian Seven, on a few other, uh, on a few other human rights issues, uh, that's where Reagan not only really wants to push and is willing to kind of stick his neck out, but it's also where the Soviet Union recognizes that they have a problem. Uh, and in the last chapter of the book, uh, I talk about some of Gorbachev's feelings about human rights. Um, and contrary to what we think of as, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev, in those early years, he's really frustrated uh, about the human rights issue. He thinks that the Americans are being hypocrites, unsurprisingly, but he also really poo-poos this whole notion, uh, which is at odds even with just the Gorbachev of five years later, or maybe even less than five years later, maybe only three years later. Um, so he, he's very frustrated uh, by that. And I think that it's effectively used by the United States as a tool, but that's not to say that the only players in the game are, uh, are Americans, right? It's not to say that it's just the Reagan administration that makes anything happen on human rights. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of, that's, uh, there are many wonderful books that do tell that story uh, and, and mine's not one of them. On the European detente point, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because in the, in the book, the Europeans kind of come and go and, and, and indeed Maggie Thatcher probably is the most prominent, a function of her close relationship with Reagan, um, but so too are our West German and French leaders uh, in particular who are trying to keep the channels of communications open. Uh, and in the book at, at various points, at various junctures, I try to highlight how the fact that they did that uh, emboldens the Reagan administration to kind of keep going or to go further. That, that this is uh, a really useful input as the Reagan administration thinks about what to do and also to the Soviet Union, right? Because some of those reassurances about credibility, good faith, sincerity, they're not coming in the letters from Reagan to Chernyenko. They're coming from a visit by Cole uh, or Hans Dietrich Genscher uh, or someone like that who is making the case. As a Canadian, I can't help but, but toot 
toot the Canadian horn. Um, it's basically all we've got to do this every once in a while uh, of, of uh, Pierre Trudeau's so-called peace mission, which the Reagan administration kind of resented, uh, but which you know, didn't generate big results on its own, but it was one, a useful trial balloon, and two, was a reassurance to the Soviet side that, that Reagan was not just focused on uh, attacking them, that he was actually, to invert Thatcher's words, that Reagan was a man with whom the Kremlin could do business. Uh, and so I think that's really vitally important as well, um, though uh, mea culpa, uh, not kind of the central theme of, 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 my, of my book. I try to integrate these stories as I see them playing out uh, on the, the bigger trends of the Cold War. I noticed that one of the people who endorse your book very fulsomely, and rightly so, is Mary Sorotti, uh, an, an old friend of LSC Ideas and a, an old friend and known to many of us. And Mary, as you know, uh, Dr. Sorotti wrote on Germany and coal and what, what actually happened, the Berlin Wall. Maybe you could say something about Helmut Kohl in all this, because you mentioned Mrs. Thatcher, which we tend to do a bit over here. Um, but I, I think what, what Mary does, and Mary, Mary Sorotti and others do, is quite important. Would it have really been the end of the Cold War without the coming down of the Berlin Wall? And would it really have been the end of the Cold War without Helmut Kohl pushing hard, as we know he did, on, uh, on, on German unification? Could you maybe deal with that one? Because that follows on from what we've just been talking about. Yes, um, I think that's a great question. Uh, so Ronald Reagan would disagree with my answer to you. But I would say, no, it wouldn't have been the end of the Cold War without the coming down of the Berlin Wall. Uh, Reagan could envision what he called an end to the Cold War in mm. which the competition became normalized and subsided. Um, and, and I struggle with that, to be honest. I, I, mm. I struggle to envision a future, uh, to Im imagine a world like that. Um, and uh, Reagan, it seems could to a certain extent, but, but I struggle to because of the centrality of Germany, because that major question of international politics remained unresolved. Uh, and there's also a third world angle to this. You know, in, mm. the, in the book, I describe the Cold War, and this is uh, a base, this is a, a you know, a, I'm painting with a broad brush and certainly someone could, could dispute this, but I describe the Cold War as a struggle over modernity, right? And while so much of the world was still in that process and with two, uh, two not just superpowers, but blocks which were advancing very different definitions of modernity centered either on the market or the state, I don't see that competition going away. And, and part of my evidence for that is that we see to a certain extent similar phenomena playing out today in, in, in various African countries, uh, for example, as the United States and, and the People's Republic of China are both kind of making their case uh, for, for, uh, for development and modes of development. So <laughs> I don't, I don't see the, the Cold War really ending without uh, a settlement of the German question, to borrow, you know, kind of a classical phrase from international history. Um, and, uh, and I think Kohl is, is a critical player here. Uh, Reagan is not irrelevant, but, but that's a German story. Um, mm. And I would argue uh, that, that the most important uh, figures are not the, the, the high office holders. It's, it's the East Germans on the street who really sort of mm. took, took the reins of history mm. uh, in, in Leipzig in, in October or in, in Berlin in, in November uh, and who changed the course of the Cold War. And that story is, is not a grand strategy story, right? That mm. story is, is, a, is a, a beautiful accident story to a certain mm. extent. Uh, mm. I think Mary would, would say that I'm going too far in saying that, mm. but, but still that, that some of the, the, the happenstance, the highly contingent nature is so wonderfully illustrated by what happened on the night of the 9th of November.
I also remember a great book written many years ago. I thought it was a great book anyway, uh, by Jacques Levesque. And he, about the unintended liberation of Eastern Europe. And I think that also brings out contingency as well, quite well, doesn't it, Simon? We, after the event, as I said earlier, and we were thinking it had to happen because the peoples of Eastern Europe or East Germany were oppressed. Uh, but no, at the time, it, 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 it was very open. And again, I go back. I was there. I remember. I mean, I even remember giving a terrible paper in Paris at the time at a conference saying, I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to change because I was so, so, I'd so bought into the notion that all the structures upholding the system and the ideologies and the interests mm -hmm. of the system, including stability and keeping Germany divided in the case of some people. And, and look, for example, if I can just interject really yeah. quickly, Please. Look at how the East Germans responded to the massacre at Tiananmen Square. Absolutely. Their basic takeaway, you know, they send the Ministry for State Security, the Shazi, um, along with some other elements of the government, basically sends a fact-finding mission to, to the People's Republic, not to say, how did this horrible thing happen, mm -hmm. but to say, okay, so how do we do this if, do you if do you know, things... Mm -hmm reach a boiling point here. Mm. Um, they were very interested in this and, and they certainly. thought, okay, we need to think about how we can deal with something like this. One of the extraordinary parts of this story is that they fail to do so. Uh, but we can see, for example, from the work, including by Mary Sorati on what happens uh, in Dresden, that they are preparing to do exactly that with the mm. massing forces uh, to, to do their own uh, Tiananmen type operation. They ultimately mm. uh, don't succeed in doing so. So I, I'm with you that, that uh, this, is, this is highly contingent. And, yeah. and uh, I think it, it behooves us as historians when we look back on the past uh, to do our best not to impose kind of false logics. Mm. Uh, and that was certainly a pitfall that I was keenly, uh, mm. of which I was keenly aware in, in, in undertaking this book. You, if I break in there, you mentioned China and would the East Germans have, you know, if you like, pursued the Chinese line, which turned out to be, well, they didn't do it. And I, I suspect that you, you, may, you may think of this as different. Largely, I imagine, under strong Soviet pressure coming from Moscow to, to, the, to the Stasi and to Honecker, not to do it. But maybe there were internal forces within East Germany as well. But that's the story I've normally been told. Um, which brings in the China, the, China, the China question, if I can put it in those terms. Because there is an argument that uh, the great end of the Cold War doesn't come at one point. It comes in stages. And one of the arguments is, of course, Part one of the end, part one of the end of the Cold War, the beginning of the end of the Cold War, is actually the great detente or the great rapprochement between the People's Republic of China and the United States and other Western countries in the 1970s. And this adds a further pressure upon the, uh, on the USSR. It removes any form of relationship between China and the USSR, which wasn't very good anyway. And somebody said to me once, you know, China was our best, next best member of NATO, you know, because it held down so many, uh, so many troops on the on the Chinese Soviet border. To what degree do you, there is a Chinese side to this story, which also needs to be told, because Gorbachev also went to Beijing, as we know. And in some senses, it is argued that not only were there domestic factors that led to Tiananmen, but, but also the Gorbachev factor, which led to maybe you could. Bring that in a bit too into your discussion now, Simon. So I, I uh, let me give you two answers. Uh, okay. And the first answer is kind of a more macro answer, which, you know, I wonder if, you know, 20 years from now, someone picks up this book off the shelf and, and looks at the, you know, the dust jacket inside flap or something and says, Wait, he's, he's talking about the Cold War and it's all about the United States and the Soviet Union? What, that's a weird sideshow. Why do you go down that niche? <laughs> um, I, I wonder the extent to which that aspect will, will you know, be challenged just by changing realities and, and the, the distance that we, we're going to get over time. Um, and for that, I don't have a very good answer, uh, in part because if I could predict what happens 20 years from now, I'd be a much richer man. Um, but in this book, uh, as it is, uh, 
the People's Republic is, is quite important uh, in its relationship with the United States. The, the Soviets are very worried about what they see the increasing, as the increasing closeness of relations between Washington and Beijing over the course of Reagan's term in, term in office. There's a degree of intelligence sharing, which is mm -hmm. quite new. There's a degree of military cooperation, which is very worrying and you know, distressing to the Soviet Union. Um, there's just the fact that George H.W. Bush, the vice president, had been the United States' de facto, if not de jure, ambassador uh, in Beijing earlier in his career. Uh, and the Reagan administration really goes very far to build up the relationship, in part for bigger economic reasons. I'm not saying that the only motivating factor here was a, a desire to stick it to the Soviets, but certainly no one in the White House is, uh, is not alive to the fact that this is causing real problems in Moscow. And in the book, I highlight some Soviet documents which are talking exactly about this phenomenon. What, mm. in, in one very uh, really memorable term, they describe as the, the confluence of American imperialism and Pekingese hegemonism <laughs> uh, as, as posing a unique danger uh, to the Soviet Union and to, and to the the, the health uh, of international communism. So in that, in that sense, uh, the People's Republic plays a role. It also comes up a little bit apropos of Gorbachev uh, and how he thinks about reforms and what he later on senses as being kind of within the realm of the possible rooted in some of Deng Xiaoping's uh, own, own policy choices uh, in, in the People's Republic. Uh, and in those senses, uh, China matters to this story and my, my big question is, is the extent to which this story continues to matter to a world with even more of a presence of China. Uh, mm -hmm. If I can offer one observation, uh, in China today, the end of the Soviet Union is a topic of great focus. Mm -hmm. uh, about Maybe about a year ago, I want to say, um, I, I was informed, for example, of a series of training videos uh, that had been produced on the Gorbachev reforms and the, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, um, which, you know, were explicitly saying, be careful, or this is what happens to us. Um, mm -hmm. The story wasn't about how communism could be adapted to changing realities, right? Mm -hmm. It was it was a cautionary tale. Um, yeah. so they they take this seriously. No, I, I the one person you know and I know, and many of our listeners and viewers will know is uh, Odani Westad, of course, who's now at Yale and formerly of the LSE, with whom I worked for many years and still continue to collaborate and great friend. And uh, if anybody taught me more about China than anybody else, it was certainly Arnie. We talked together at Beijing University. Uh, and he brought home to me, as did others, you know, the, the sheer intensity of analysis that went on on the Chinese side, setting up commissions right throughout the 1990s and beyond. And I came to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that you know, modern China really begins with the collapse of the USSR in the sense that it is what lessons do you learn if a great superpower collapses? How do you stop it happening to you? And in a way, I still feel that's an enormous factor in the driver of you know, Chinese economic policies, its foreign policies, and indeed, it's very tough domestic policies, which began, of course, with Tiananmen Square. I've got another question for you here, really. It's about Latin America. You touched on the third world. And again, Arnie Westhead, of course, has written about this. Um, what about Latin America in this discussion? Um, because obviously Reagan's uh, counter strategy against Soviet empire, against the evil empire, wasn't just about military or economics, whatever. It was also about the third world, which was a preoccupation. I also remember a good friend of mine here at the LSE, no longer with us, very sadly, a good old friend and comrade, Fred Halliday, who wrote a lot about the third world in that period, although he wasn't a Latin American, he knew a hell of a lot about it, as he did about most countries in the world. 
just bring the Latin American side into this. Where, where does it fit into your narrative? And the other question asked by a colleague here is, you talk about the end of the Cold War, but what about the legacies, yeah. the end of the Cold War, not only in Latin America, but maybe more generally, but take it to Latin America. Thanks for, for that question from our friend. Uh, so Latin America, to be very candid, doesn't figure very largely in this in this book, which is which is a book about U.S.-Soviet relations. But it's of course impossible to one not think about the devastation done to uh, the region by not only U.S. but also Soviet and and, and uh, Cuban interventions. Uh, in the name of the Cold War, right? And so, so that, that caveat uh, has to be there as we think about evaluating uh, the Reagan administration in any sense, because uh, it certainly, uh, it certainly is, is um, uh, an important, an important uh, kind of counterpoint to some of the more laudatory evidence that I that I bring to bear uh, in this book. When Reagan is thinking about the US-Soviet sort of balance of power, if you will, at the beginning of the 1980s, one of the key points for him is how he assesses the situation in Latin America and also in the Caribbean. Uh, so he describes in, I think, 1981, the Caribbean is a red lake. Mm -hmm. uh, and he certainly uh, does not think that things are going well in, in Latin America either for, for American interests. And thus, when he forms these strikingly pessimistic views on where the Soviet Union sits vis-a-vis -vis the United States, uh, he, a big part of that story is Latin America. Thus, and as we know, with tragic consequences, uh, it becomes really important to him to push back uh, perceived Soviet gains in the, in the region and, of course, elsewhere once he's, once he's in power. It's because I think Reagan was very focused on the relationship with the Soviet Union that a lot of Latin America policy and other policy uh, as well, Middle East policy, for example, uh, is not really something that he oversees. Uh, and we, we see kind of the, the real downside of a lot of Reagan's pretty hands-off management style uh, unfolding in events like that, like Iran-Contra, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an important part uh, of, of the story. Um, and, and I, in, in this book, uh, try to reference it as it as it pertains to my topic, but also to direct people to the other you know, really wonderful work that's already been done by so many scholars on those important questions uh, for to get more of a sense from people who have the, the regional expertise um, on it. On the legacies, um, the last, the, the, the book's I think it ended up being called a conclusion, but I think I wanted it to be called an epilogue. Uh, however, whatever moniker you put on it, the last section of the, of the book proper, I try to take this story up to the present day. Uh, and of course, we know the, the violence visited on Latin America is still felt in, uh, in, uh, in certain, you know, policy issue areas which are very salient, not only in the region, in the United States as well. For example, the rise of, of very violent organized crime organization uh, and entities, which, which traces some route back to the, the brutal civil wars uh, of, uh, of, of the 1980s before and of course uh, later. In this book, I talk more about the Soviet Union's former citizens, uh, the kind of the Soviet orphans, if you will. Uh, who experience the power transition, which I narrate in the book. Uh, and the obvious main character for such a story is current president and former Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vladimir Putin, who has a front row seat to the collapse of Soviet power. Uh, primarily in East Germany, right? He is a KGB officer stationed as a kind of uh, Stasi liaison um, who in Dresden watches it all happen. And, and it's very alive and very personal to him. And this, 
the case that I make in the book uh, is that our conventional periodization of the end of the Cold War, beginning in 85, ending in 91, obscures some fundamental truths for folks who are in key leadership positions in Moscow today. Because the conventional periodization works with a pretty triumphalist narrative, right? The United States is strong, the Soviets are weak, and to, to, to paraphrase Thucydides, you know, the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. And thus, why shouldn't the U.S. have expanded NATO uh, as far east as possible? Or, or, or why shouldn't the U.S. have, have kind of imposed so-called shock therapy uh, on, on, the, the, so, on, the, on Russia, et cetera, et cetera? Um, open the aperture just five more years and the story isn't about a strong United States and a weak Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It's about a weak, but a weak, but you know, maybe a little bit optimistic United States and a strong, but kind of worried uh, Soviet Union and Soviet leaders trying to arrest that decline. And thus the notions of that, that the Soviet Union's ideology going away didn't necessarily me need to mean the collapse of Soviet power. These aren't kind of hearkening back to some imagined halcyon days of the past. These are just a few years earlier. This is the lived experience of key policymakers in Russia today, including but not limited to uh, the, current, the current president. And I think understanding that gives us a degree of really valuable empathy. Uh, in, and I say empathy, right, not sympathy. A degree of really valuable empathy in understanding the worldview of Russian leaders today who are trying to get back to that, not to communism, not to the Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, but mm. to something approximating what was their reality just at the beginning of the 1980s. When Arnie Westad and myself set up the Cold War Studies program uh, back in 2004, a little bit of a little long time ago, Simon, one of the things we were looking at then, and they, indeed in some sense it was the driving intellectual argument behind establishing the Cold War Studies Center, supported by people like Fred Halliday, Mary Calder, or, and many others at the school at the time, was to think about the legacies of the, of, of the end of the Cold War and the legacies. Of, and this was actually very soon after 9-11, 2001. And, you know, can one understand 9-11 without the Cold War and how the Cold War ended qua Afghanistan? You know, what you've described for South Central America, Central America especially. Can one understand the violence of the state there and organized forms of crime without the end of the... Bringing it back to Europe, what happened to former Yugoslavia? Between 80, this has been one of the great success story, communist state, if you like, of the Cold War period, a bit more open, allowed its people to go, you know, go and work in Germany and all the rest of it. Tourism, look at that. So the legacies, it seems to me, are all too real. And that's why I think one of the best things I think Arnie and I did, and certainly I did with Arnie, was, of course, to set up that Cold War Studies program, which is still going very, very, very well today. I'm going to end, however, on one on last question. This is a kind of PhD question, isn't it? If there's something you might have done differently in terms of writing, that's a very unfair question, by the way. But I'll throw it in anyway, Simon, if you don't mind. Is it if, if you could revise the book in any serious ways, what, what what one particular way would you which direction would you take the revision? Sorry, it's a bit of a question, but you've just no, I, like, I think that's a that's a nice question. And it you know, I actually I think about that. Um, in part mm. based on the wonderful questions that I, I get from folks who are generous enough to invite me to come and talk about the book uh, with them. And so I try to keep a log of those questions so that I can yeah. think about what yeah. I could preempt uh, in the future. And, and absent the two typographical er errors, which I've already caught <laughs> in the book, um, which are minor um, and which are- But annoying, but annoying. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the one thing that I would like, I would probably try to do more justice to uh, is the American domestic political context. Mm. Um, I think that that matters. And I think that it's a big important part of the story. I try to acknowledge it, for example, apropos of one, the sense of pessimism 
to the sense uh, that Reagan's so-called reversal, a, a narrative, a, an interpretation against which I argue quite forcefully in the book, was just cynical politics, right? That it was um, that it was all about securing a 1984 re-election. Um, I, I think that uh, engaging the evil empire too. Uh, would would probably do well to have even more tracing of the home front, so to speak, in the United States, which I think I I, I think I, I'd be interested in your thought thoughts. I think I do less well than I trace actually the Soviet domestic political context mm. in terms mm. of uh, of the sense of of life in the Soviet Union at the time. Mm. Uh, that's that's probably what I would turn my attention to first. Mm, mm. Well, that's a very interesting and open and honest answer. Simon, I think we're going to call it to an end now. We, we said we'd run for an hour. We've actually gone over. We've kept nearly all of our participants, which is, which is great, which says a lot about the quality of your answers to a series of very fine and interesting questions. We've ranged far and wide. I haven't asked you the inevitable question, but somebody has asked it. You don't have to go into great detail. Are we now living in a new Cold War, whether it's with the West and Russia and China? My own, my own take on this is a rather, well, I think the Cold War ended. We have a legacy, but I, I don't want to call it a new Cold War. I don't know if you agree with that particular view. Uh, yeah, I, I get this question fairly frequently. Yeah, I know. No, um, mm. because missing from the current competition is... Uh, a positive, and I don't use the term positive in a normative sense, but, mm. but rather a positive message from another uh, ideological side, right? Mm. That, that if you look at what China's doing in Africa, they're not trying to communize countries. Uh, they're trying to generate economic influence and leverage through, through debt. Um, that's what's missing. Uh, mm. And that, I think, was key, as I gave my definition of the Cold War. That's what's missing in the current moment. Also, and this might sound a little pessimistic, when I look at the history of, of the human condition, competition between states is not an aberration for which we need a special name, mm -hmm. right? Like we don't, we, we give things special names like the Cold War to indicate that there's something different about them, that they don't kind of fit the norms, the mold, mm -hmm. the trends, what have you. Major powers like, for example, the United States and the People's Republic of China today competing, that's normal. That doesn't need a moniker to kind of offset it. Mm. That's just, mm. for better or for worse, the pattern of, 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 of history. So for those two reasons, uh, yeah. I, I'm a no on new Cold War, <laughs> second of Cold yeah, War. Well, as I would say, Simon, if I was interviewing you for a job, you've got the job because you've answered the question correctly. No, I agree entirely with you. But that's, <laughs> that's a larger debate to be had, but thanks for that. Great. Now, I've got a couple of announcements to make. One is um, there's a short feedback form to will appear in your browser when this event ends shortly we'd be grateful if you could take one minute just to tell us what you thought of the event that'd be very helpful so we can improve on what we deliver and finally thank you all for coming along today joining us that's a very nice comment simon uh from a friend in the united states susan wolf who often attends our sessions she had to go at seven seven o'clock but she said thank you so much she really really enjoyed the conversation especially your contribution so thank you so there's a lot you made a lot of fans out there today Simon thank you uh, not at all it's been absolutely wonderful I'd like to thank all the people in the background so to speak Dave Sutton Jess Keating I'd like I'd like to thank the Cold War Studies program run by Rohan here at the LSE and last but by no means least Simon thank you very much a thank you for your scholarship Thank you for answering the questions directly. And I thought with great verve, I might say. But after all, you did do a master's at the LSE and I wouldn't expect <laughs> anything else. So that's thank my you. last plug for the LSE. And Simon, thank you again for everything. Thank you all so much. It was a real pleasure to be with you even uh, in this format. And thanks very thanks. much, Nick, in particular. Thanks again, Simon. And all the very best to you and keep safe, keep well. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers.